the lost and found. And God added the lost and found in some practical way, which is in forgiveness. Okay, so that's what I'm, I'm attempting to set out on. I've got a few notes, but I just want to read this to begin with, to, to get you in the right to, sort of frame of mind. It's from uh, John 3, and you are 16 if you need to look it up. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Just a positive note, okay, something, I find that quite fantastic, personally, okay? But I just want to do that at the beginning, because what I want to talk about um, is, uh, I don't know whether you ever feel trapped, okay? As if you feel as if, uh, we were talking about this on Friday night, in fact, you get so busy with things that, you know, you just feel as if you're doing this all the time, spinning around, rather than uh, practically. Um, getting a grip on what you need to do or focusing on what God is actually speaking to you at that time okay and I wonder if you ever feel like breaking out and running away I know for me one of those points was I had a dad who was really hard on me okay he was a coal miner alright and he had quite a tough life and so what he decided to do was to be hard with me Okay? Every single thing. He never ever said, well done Ted. Alright? The, the epitome that I always use, and I may have used this for some of us before, I apologise, but was when I acted for two and a half hours on stage, just in the lead part, okay, in this play. My dad was there for a change, okay? And I missed one line, okay, in the whole thing, and had to have a cue, alright? And everybody came up to me at the end and said, yeah, it's really great today. Well done, well done, well done. You know what my dad said? You missed a cue. And stormed off. Okay? And to an extent, I never really understood that. And praise God, I felt like running away or smashing him in the teeth a lot of the time. So as my teenagehood went on, okay, that was not very pleasant for me. And I often felt, I'm going to run away. I'm going to get lost from this. I don't know whether you've ever felt that. But to an extent, um, I don't know about you, but the, um, sometimes we might do clumsy, stupid things, or say the wrong thing, or whatever, and you feel, oh, do you? Why on earth did I say that, or do that, or whatever? And it's at that point that you've got to decide what to do. Now, we've just acted through, okay, an absolutely brilliant part of the Bible, as far as I'm concerned, because... You know, I could spend, what, three hours on that and still not touch the surface of it. But I want you to think about the prodigal, okay, the prodigal son, and what he was like. And he just had to get away, didn't he? Okay? And he wanted to do all the things that uh, he'd wanted to do and never got a chance to do. And then he did them, and what happened? Okay? He made a right mess of it, didn't he? An absolute and complete mess. And ended up, okay, poor, feeding pigs. Okay? Yeah. If you can imagine to a Jewish man what that was like, yeah. okay? That was terrible. Okay? And so he, he suddenly stopped. And he thought, this is all wrong. Why on earth am I doing this? Why on earth? Even the, the servants of my father, okay, can live in a better world than I can. Yeah. And so he decided, decided to do something, and that was to repent. To go back to his father and to say, Father, I've done wrong here. I've done something terribly wrong here. Okay? And I just want to apologise that I took half your money and I've just squandered it. And so he went back. Okay? And this tells us an awful lot about what the Father is like for us. And especially when you do something that's wrong or, you know, isn't part of his plan for you or whatever. Because can you remember what happened? What the father did when he saw his son at a distance coming back. Anybody remember what that is? He He ran. ran. Yeah, okay. He didn't wait to hear, I'm really sorry, okay, I've done the wrong thing, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. Because the father knew. 
exactly what was going on in his son's life at that time. And to an extent for us, that's the same thing. Whatever we do and wherever we are, and when we feel, wow, that is all wrong, and want to repent, and want to turn around, you can know that we have a Father God who doesn't just sit there waiting for you right. to tell you off or to have a go at you. He's there waiting. And what did he do? How did he run? Can you remember the, the expression that's used in the Bible? With open eyes. Okay. Now I don't know what that says to you. It says lots of things to me because that was the crucifix position in many respects, but that's a side issue in some respects. But he opened his loving arms. And you know that whatever you do in this life and whatever happens to you, okay, if it's wrong or not what you would want to, to have done or whatever, to repent, to say to God, oh, I'm really, really sorry. What am I like? You know, I just seem to open my mouth at the wrong times. So, we're talking about when we're lost, okay, when we feel that, oh, we've done this, and, but we want to be found by God. And uh, how many times do we have to forgive other people? I've gone to another tap now, to our relationship with other people. Because that's about relationship with our God. But what about relationships to other people? And Peter poses a, a magnificent question to him. Okay? Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And what is the answer? Seven. Seventy-seven times. Again and again and again and again and again. Because forgiveness is part of what God wants for us to swish us out and all the rest of it. Now, the thing is that, um, what do we do at that time? I want you to imagine that as well as passing around the money basket, okay, that today, I want to pass around another basket. And I want you to think about, right now, the people who have said words against you, or that you don't like, or that are... Uh, uh, getting up your nose or whatever expression you might want to use to that okay? and think about the feelings that that gives you inside okay? and we all do this okay? I do it, you do it, etc and God says forgive full stop God says forgive and so what I want you to do okay, I'm going to walk round here with a pretend basket and if you if Immediately, somebody's name or a situation or whatever that might be has come into your mind. I want you to figuratively place it in this thing. That person, that situation, whatever, please. Okay? That <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Bless you. Bless you. Now then, let's get this into a, a practical sort of situation. What I want to do is I want to read, okay, I was talking to somebody about forgiveness, okay, and they said, Ted, it's funny you should mention that, okay? But something's happened in my family life that I would not have believed could happen. And I said, write it down for me and I'll use it in a sermon at some point. So just, just get a grip. This is real life. This isn't for, you know, me uh, waxing flowery. This is what happened. There are times in life where it can be hard to be a Christian. And it's strange but true that God can make you very wary of what you should do and our human nature can get in the way of doing what we ask God to do every single day. But are we prepared to do ourselves for fear of rejection or pride? I don't know whether you've ever been there, but I certainly have. My brother David and I fell out three years ago. 
If we had talked it through instead of hurling abuse at each other, and yes, I admit, I should not have lost my temper either, but my mouth sometimes says the words before my brain goes into gear. I prayed about the situation and hoped my brother would see that it was him that needed to approach me. He didn't. I kept feeling that I should do something, put, but kept putting it off for fear of rejection. I thought about sending a Christmas card but changed my mind. I thought how this would hurt me if I didn't get hear from him. I did not talk with any with my two other brothers about anything that was happening in his life. Because the mention of his name reminded me of the rift between us. And then, sometimes, you just know that you have had a sign from God. My youngest brother Peter had been up to our mum and dad's grave, and as I went to place my flowers, I noticed his. One red rose for each of our four children was placed there. On each rose was a little card tied with a ribbon. The first rose had on it love. The second had can. The third build and the fourth a bridge. Love can build a bridge. My youngest brother was hurting too. It was just so obvious by what he had done. I knew then I had to do something. How could I, as a Christian, not forgive my brother and yet expect and ask God to f- for forgiveness for myself? My brother's birthday was 11th of July. I chose a birthday card and in it I asked him if we could put the past behind us and I told him how much I loved him. Four days went by and I had begun to think that he was not going to ring. I had asked him that he ring me if he was interested in contact again. And then the night before we were going on holiday, he rang and said he missed me too and was really glad I had made the approach. We arranged to meet for a coffee on my return. And when we met, it was like the argument had never happened. We kissed and had a cuddle and a few tears together and talked. We both admitted we shouldn't have said some of the things we did. We have wasted three years of that love we share with each other. We've hurt other people too, members of our family, who got caught up in the middle of this family celebrations. That we now both have both been at. But where an atmosphere is caused because we couldn't forgive. I now have a feeling of elation that is over. I can enjoy the closeness of that special bond you have with the brother. I have been given another chance to enjoy the gift of having brothers. All three of them delighting in the four of us being able to share time lost together. I thank God that I also can forgive and forget just as he forgets, forgives us. Lost and found in forgiveness. How's the time? Am I going on? Right. Well, I just want to tell you as well a story about somebody who's very close to me. In fact, me. Okay? And how this particular theme uh, impinges. You've heard it before, so I apologise. But what happened was that um, about 33 years ago, in fact, so it's a long time, all right, I was uh, working in a, a Christian community. And those of you who know me know that I go and go and go and go and go and go and go, all right? And I've had to learn to go and go and rest and rest and go and go. But I didn't know about it then. And so I could be opening up the, uh, the castle where I worked, which is a Christian community in the morning at 7 o'clock and leading prayers and then work all day and then in the evening be serving at the bar till 12 o'clock and all the rest of it. And I worked and worked and worked, and that gradually wore me down and wore me down and wore me down and wore me down. And eventually, okay, I just felt so worthless, so useless, okay, that I decided that my family, my friends would all be better off without me. I don't understand how I could do that, okay? When I look back at this in a rational way, I don't understand. But that's where I got to, okay? And so one day, I ran out of the castle, okay, to a huge bridge, and I jumped. Now, anybody who really knows me now, I'm scared to of heights for a start, so that was a stupid thing to do. There were huge boulders 
in the river into which I, I jumped, so I should have died like that. Okay? But praise God, that wasn't to happen. And I rolled over and over and over and over. And then I suddenly thought, I don't want to die, do I? Why do I want to die? And so I crawled out to that river, okay? And there were people who'd noticed that I'd run out, came to get me, okay? And they picked me up and I was wet through and I was taken back to the castle and I was put in bed, okay? I was absolutely wet through, so that bed would have been really, really soft, okay? And various people came to me and prayed over me, okay? And told me that they loved me and asked to apologise for the, the fact that they hadn't told me along the rest of it. And then I was in the hospital, okay? And there, the specialist who talked to me, could you imagine? By now, I was like this. I couldn't communicate with anybody. I couldn't talk to anybody. And again, those of you who know me know that that was hell for me. That was hell. I just couldn't relate to anybody. Okay? I'd been kicked so far back. And then the specialist said these words. And words can be so important to us, can't they? You know? He said, Ted, you've got to accept the fact that you're going to be a cabbage for the rest of your life. Now, if you can imagine, if, you know, somebody like me who wants to look about and have fun and all sorts, and you told by a specialist that you're going to be like that, okay? So, for the next year and a half, the, the Christian community gave me a job which was you know, just doing admin and all the rest of it. And, uh, and I gradually got a little bit better, but couldn't get completely better. Okay, I was still like this, but we decided we had to take a step of faith yeah. here. Okay, so I decided to go back into teaching that I'd done, and so they took up references. And I've been a, I'm a teacher who can relate to kids who are effing and blinding and don't want to be there and all the rest of it. So they gave me a job, okay, in which every single uh, class was like that. Okay, it was just horrendous to be quite honest I hadn't told them that I had a nervous breakdown okay so they didn't know that and so after about two or three months okay if you can imagine after every lesson I would go away and I would cry and cry and cry because I couldn't relate and some of them would go on the way out you know because they knew they could do anything because I couldn't relate alright and after three months okay in Burley, I didn't know this, but there was a mental hospital. And so I went, they sent me to this mental hospital. And there, a specialist called Dr. Clarkson, and you know how useless I am at names, but I can remember his name forever. He was a Catholic, okay, and he was a specialist. Right? He took one blood sample, just as the others had done over the last year and a half, and told me I would still be a cabbage. And he said, Give me six months and you'll be better. This is a, uh, a chemical imbalance that you've got. Said, what? Why didn't the others notice that? I, I can't tell you that. Okay. Now, I've missed a little bit out actually, which is quite important. <coughs> First of all, I was not then getting at those people who hadn't recognised it. God said, forgive them. Yeah. They don't know. You know, they didn't know. Come on, Ted. But also, when we moved out of the castle, we had no money. We'd given all our worldly wealth when we went into the castle. So, when I decided to try and work at Lawnswood School, I know any of you know that, okay? Uh, then we had to find a house, didn't we? And we didn't have very much money. So, eventually we looked around uh, Rawdon and uh, Eden and all over the place, all right? And could not... Uh, find a house that we liked. So we went back to my sister-in-law's in Burley, and there was just one house there, and it was a tatty one, and she said, oh, it's the worst road in, in Burley and Wolfdown, you know. Uh, and so we said, well, just have a look at it, okay, as we were going back. We knocked on the door, okay, and there was a Jesus sign. Wow. Okay? And they were missionaries, and the first thing they said to us, before anything else, is, are you Christians? <laughs> and we said, yeah. They said, we prayed for a Christian to come and buy this house last night. Okay? 
And that went, as you can imagine, even if I couldn't relate all that well. All right? And that was just fantastic. So we brought this house, okay, and lots of other things like that happened, which were quite incredible. But I had then to take six months off work, all right? And I thought they would say, Ted, you didn't tell us you'd had a nervous breakdown. You didn't inform us what you were like, and therefore you're sacked. That's what I expected. You do that. They said, I forget, we forgive you. We want you. We know what you're like. Take six months off and come back. Okay? So for six months, I don't know whether you can relate to a person who has to be on the go all the time having to take six months off and not do anything. <laughs> you know, not get into guilt and not get into shame and all this. So for six months I lived in this house, all right? And it was just incredible, all right? And I just relaxed into it. And lots of people came and said, we love you, we're praying for you, all right? After six months, okay? <laughs> I was back to being ten. Now, if you can imagine my lovely lady wife, okay? She's had for nearly two years... This guy, who can't relate to anybody, and then he starts leaping up and down again. What would you think? Amen. <laughs> and she said to me, Ted, you're going again, aren't you? I said, no, no, no. And the epitome came when my neighbour across the road asked me to go for, to an auction with him, because he wanted to buy a car, okay? And I went there, and it was damaged goods, and I bought 15 sleeping bags, and uh, a whole load of stuff for one pound, okay? And if you can imagine, that brings over back, look Chris, what I bought. All right, and she said, oh no, Ted, what are you doing? Okay, so I said to her, look down, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to pray, the biggest prayer you can ever think of, okay? And God will answer that, and you'll know that I'm back to be me, all right? And that was at the time when the Falklands War were on, was on, and there was no way that that was going to stop and so many people were being killed again. Chris hated that. And so she sat down and she prayed, Lord, please make the Argentinians surrender. And we were both in tears by this time, okay, and she went upstairs to wash her face and I switched the telly on, this was about 12 o'clock, okay. And guess what? Argentinian War over. Okay, so I shouted up to Chris and I said, look here. Chris, come down, come down. And it wasn't uh, Argentinians war over. Surrender. Guess what it said? Surrender. Amen. Surrender. The Argentinians surrender. And I turned to her and I said, now do you believe that I'm better? And I went back to school. And if you can imagine these <laughs> kids that I was teaching who had been slapping me across the face and abusing me and all sorts for all the time I was there. And you know what they did? They were eating out my hand. They saw the transformation in this guy who could not relate to people. And now he was up and at it, okay? And so for about a month, they refused to let me teach them. They wanted to know about Jesus. Wow. Can you imagine that? That is just amazing. Until after a month, I had to say to them, forget about Jesus, okay? His <laughs> <laughs> work, okay? And they said, yeah, okay. And I built some phenomenal relationships with those kids, okay? Not by me, and not by... And it would be very easy to say, God, why on earth did you allow me to go through that? Because that's a question I kept asking. How can a Christian be like that, you know? And I discovered the forgiveness, the power, the amazing love that God has in any situation that we find ourselves in. And some people believe that, you know, God wants us to suffer, okay? And that's what we, we were born to do. But I believe that God allows us to go through certain experiences so that we're in a position to help. Yeah. Okay? I find it amazing that at the beginning of this year, okay, one of the women, after Dan had preached, came to me and said, Ted, I want to give my life to the Lord. I haven't been out of the house for two weeks. I've been suffering from mental illness. Do you understand what I'm saying here? And I was able to say to her, 
You've been feeling like this. You've been feeling like that. Because it was an experience that God had allowed me to have so that I could minister, so that I could bless, so that I could love this woman fully and completely. And so, I don't know about you, but if the circumstances of your life or particular people or whatever it might be, okay, I want you not to see it as the world sees it. I, I put a situation to a group the other week um, about somebody who had abused my wife and all sorts, okay? And we said, the world says, go and smash him. Okay? But God told me, this guy needs some help. Yeah. Okay? And to pray for them. And it's almost like, I don't know whether you notice or not, but I got new glasses. Okay? You probably didn't. <laughs> and that's what it's like. If you give the situation, the person, whatever it might be, to God... It's like seeing things through new glasses. It's like putting on something very, very special. And believe me, that just like this woman that I've read about, about the problems with her brother, or me going through all that, okay? It'd be very easy to say, oh, well, what, what God would allow me to go through all that? But for the last 33 years, 